Good evening. How are you? Well, it's beautiful out. Uh, it's in. The, it's late in the evening, so the sun is low. But it's in the 70s after a recent rain shower, and the humidity is uh, like uh, 80. <laughs> but I don't feel it, and there is zero wind, so it's a it's a nice it's a nice evening. Uh, well, let's talk about the the news a little bit. There are a couple of different things that I think are interesting to look at. The um, first one up is one of my favorite judges. I'm being sarcastic is uh, Judge Luce Cannon down in Florida, federal judge who basically has uh, steered and mismanaged the case if justice matters as a standard when you're a judge. And she seems to be on a single-minded path to save Trump from the prosecution that's before her. And you may recall that her most recent decision was to throw out the case because she decided that the prosecutor, Jack Smith, was not authorized properly to do this. Jack Smith filed a brief today, one day early, uh, basically taking the judge to task, saying that he most certainly did have the authority uh, to appear because the Attorney General had the authority to appoint Smith. And Cannon ignored decades of precedence. I know for the Supreme Court, this has become a standard of care to protect Trump and his goons, but there it is. And uh, Cannon therefore shut down, and I think only for a short period of time, but that is one of the objectives, delay. And she has shut down, though, what many say is the worst case or the best case, depending on how you want to put it, against Trump. You know, he's not supposed to have something, he has it, and then he's made statements about it, showing that he knows it. He moved it around, so he obstructed justice, and so, on, so forth. This is a very sad state of affairs in the United States. When you have a judge like that on the bench, you have an attorney general that doesn't kick her in the hindquarters in a metaphorical and legal sense. And people are deferring the trial to a later time. And because of this case, it forces us to collapse the experience we've had over a lifetime, or what you've read if you didn't live through some of these things, in this way. This is not new. There are at least two laws in America. You and I, we get the one that we have to work our tails off to justify what we did or to get the things that we should be enabled to get with more alacrity and equity but we don't. But then there's the other group, and they're up in the clouds like the gods of the myths of, of Or, Yor. And they, oh, you don't dare touch them. Why? Because they'll crush you like a bug. They have the power to push you back, to destroy your life, to make you a non-person in whatever it is you do. And a lot of people let themselves open to that because just like the mob does it, you give people considerations and then they get used to it and they want it and they don't want to give it up. I don't want to give up that congressional seat. I don't want to give up that cabinet post. I don't want to give up the opportunity someday to be a member of Congress. I want to be a judge in the Court of Appeals. I'm sure that's never crossed Judge Luce Cannon's mind. What do you think? So, what is going to happen? I think she's going to be overruled. I think, in addition, he who would be an attorney general but is not, Garland, will probably say, oh, we'll deal with it after the election. As a young man in New York, I became interested in the corruption in our political system. And it was a time when we were looking at corrupt cops. We were looking at a whole variety of things in the city. And so when I applied to the U.S. Attorney in the Southern District of New York, those are the cases I wanted to handle. 
But before, and I didn't know I would get admitted, I hoped that I would, and I was ultimately, but I also went over to New Jersey. There was a prosecutor there named Stern, and he was following the money to make corruption cases. So I was immersed in this, and the day I was sworn in, two kinds of corruption cases going on that day, and I was assigned to one, a securities fraud case. It's going to take five weeks, and I... And they were literally choosing the jury while I was being sworn in and assigned to the criminal division by Paul Curran. That same day, Rudy Giuliani, then a very different person, very admirable, very helpful to others. He was a Bobby Kennedy Democrat at that time. We're talking about the father, not this wastrel son. And he went into court against a congressman named Podell, and his cross-examination was so effective that Podell agreed to interrupt his testimony and to plead guilty. That was the paradigm for a guy like me. And I served in a number of sections in the U.S. Attorney's Office, but the one I wanted to serve under and serve in was the official corruption unit. And I ultimately did serve in that unit and made other cases. In fact, I, I was part of a team that prosecuted a congressman from wilkes Bear, Pennsylvania, Dan Flood. So that is the tradition I'm familiar with. Maine justice, however, falls all over itself, finding ways not to do its job. For fear of what? And of the weakest kind of speaking by any public figure, Garland should just stay home if he has nothing to say. Well, anyhow, enough of that. So, what else is going on? I think one of the things that's interesting to me is this new form of ageism. That is to say, we're finding out, because there are people longer in the tooth continuing to work in their 70s and 80s, there's a claim, I assume there's a poll that says this, that the earlier generations are reckless to go forward and uh, they don't think it's cool that uh, people who have spent their life working should be able to continue to do so. Well, these are the benefits, I guess, of what we've learned about the human body and how one can live and enlarge a lifestyle. Not for everybody, but it happens. And it's kind of short-sighted. What are they going to think? when they get to the same crossroad and all of a sudden they're 70 or 80 and they want to work. Are we going to let them? Now let's return to uh, central politics, not just uh, who's interested in what jobs in the political system, but the con. And I'm talking about uh, one of the cons of Trump. Now, I want you to lean back, unless you're walking with me. <laughs> Imagine you're in Montezuma Canyon in Arizona at the border of Mexico. And you can see before you, coming down a hill, a fence, and it stops. It stops. Now, Trump just a couple of days ago, said if he has a second term, he's going to finish that wall. Now, isn't this beautiful? You have an illustration of the callous nature and drifting ability of Trump because <laughs> he... He, he claimed, oh, what did he, he said it was the, well, back in 2016, he said he would, I think that's when he said it, he said he would create the Rolls Royce of walls. Well, yeah, that's sort of like if a, a car has no gas or tires, uh, that's the kind of, <laughs> kind of wall he's building, because if you can walk around a wall, it's not a wall. And, uh, and we can't ignore the origins of this. Uh, for this $35 million a mile wall, you should keep in mind that originally in 2016,
Trump said Mexico was going to pay for it. Okay, we all know about that. He estimated it would be 8 to $12 billion to finish the wall. Okay. But the, the mall was, the wall rather, the mall, that's interesting. The wall was supposed to be a thousand miles long. <laughs> Trump only made 47 miles of that wall. And what he made of the wall, we taxpayers paid for it, not Mexico. Now, there are a couple of things about this. If you're one of those Christo, Christo fascists, <laughs> are you concerned about the kind of man who lies to America and then says, give me another four years. This time I'll finish the wall when I didn't before. Why isn't it so clear that this guy, well, is what, <laughs> he, he's, he's not a worker bee. He doesn't do things. Proverbs, I think it's chapter 26, has a couple of proverbs that work here. <laughs> so one of them, and I'm paraphrasing, so you can go test me with the King James Version or whatever is your preferred one. But whoever boasts of an undelivered gift is like a cloud and wind, but without rain. <laughs> and uh, in that same, pretty close to that section, there's another one that says something like, uh, confidence in an unfaithful man is like a broken tooth or a turned out foot. You'll have to check that. But the sense of these is number one, people make promises they have no intention, nor ability, nor resolve to complete. They just want to fool you, mislead you. And then we are asked to be confident of such a man, but if he's unfaithful to his promises, isn't that like an uncured breakdown? Your tooth is broken. Your foot is out of sorts. There's so much wrong with Trump. You know, they, 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 you can't get past the word absurd. You can't get past notions of delusion. And it causes you to question anyone who could with decent eyesight and hearing and recollection could vote for a guy like this. Suppose you want the wall, and I assume his people do. He did 47 miles. He hasn't paid for it. Hasn't been built. Mexico hasn't picked up the, the bill. And he's promising, give me four more years. This time I'll finish it. Why wouldn't that bother the simplest, and I mean that word in all of its different meanings, the simplest supporter of his Kool-Aid-infused delusions. How could you possibly support this guy? Now, the, uh, the papers are rightly full of how Trump has lost his bearings, doesn't know which direction to go to. And this is for his own campaign. The thing that is going to, in his mind, save him from prosecution if he can carry the day on election day. And that we're even talking about this being competitive means there's a real failing in the body politic. And it drives the veterans, the political establishment, crazy that this doesn't fit the templates they're familiar with. Where did this come from? And the truth is, it came from the values that have become embedded in many people. And the sense of fairness and equity and what's right and what's wrong. 
simple, uncomplicated, and an aversion to the kinds of personal attacks. And, you know, it's one thing to call a person out for some misconduct. It's another to make it up and repeat it and then add things to it and say, oh, that's what I believe it is. So, in the meantime, we're raising a boatload of money. We get hats that memorialize what we're fighting for at the top of the ticket. And we move forward because we have the truth on our side. And you can, you can offer arguments for different policy standpoints. But let's face it. The economy is coming back. The rates are going down. We are dealing with past unemployment problems. There's a joy in this campaign like no other in recent memory. And the people at the top of the ticket are taking very seriously their responsibilities. But they're proceeding as happy warriors, charging into this like it's the most important moment in modern American history, and it is. So... Get yourself a hat <laughs> and put out a flag and send in five bucks if you can or ten bucks or call the local party, send out postcards. Believe me, it all matters. I've seen it matter. My hero, JFK, he won a presidential election in which thousands of votes, not millions of votes, thousands of votes determine that election. And, you know, people say we're going to have that kind of election. Well, then let's get out those thousands of votes in addition to the millions of votes. And let's pay attention to the battleground states because that's where it's won or lost. And let's win this thing so we can go on with a more joyful life that we can take on the future knowing we don't have to look over our shoulders about some sort of political mugging by Trump or his minions, that we can go forward into the future and deal with the challenges that people have and get the young those jobs they can't find because old folk, in their opinion, continue to work. Because the thing this society doesn't understand, and I, I, th I thank the man for holding a door open for me, <laughs> And he said to me that in South America, they respected people who had reached a station in life when they had something intelligent to say. So, and he's not one of my uh, co-walkers, if you will, on this walk and talk. He just said this out of the blue, as far as I could tell, as we were going into a 7-Eleven. So... Uh, that's, that's how we have to approach this. It's not about how little we're getting. It's how much we have to give, how much opportunity we can make for ourselves and others. It's about how we can move on into, well, a life, a golden age of America, which has its ironies, as you well imagine. So... <laughs> So I'm going to say goodbye to you today, and with any luck, I'll be out again tomorrow, and we'll see what's happening in America. The land of the free and the home of the brave, we're coming home to roost, and we're going to put this government in order and get rid of these jackals. So I say goodbye to you from my cathedral of nearby trees. <laughs>